Well, welcome and good evening. Uh, my name is Dan McLeese. I am the chief scientist of JPL. And I'm here tonight as a steering committee member for the Keck Institute for Space Studies. Uh, the lecture tonight is also co-sponsored by the Planetary Society, with whom we're very pleased to partner. Uh, the Planetary Society is a wonderful uh, activity and group that gives the public an opportunity to really participate in space exploration. Uh, the Keck Institute for Space Studies, or as the acronym is pronounced, KISS, um, is an organization that tries to bring the public close up to topics of space exploration. And its function is to bring scientists, engineers, and technologists together to tackle some of the most interesting and important problems in the future of space exploration. We do this through hosting um, what I would call organized play among uh, these different kinds of people in research to take on these tasks through research that's done in the laboratory, research that is done through interactions with students. In fact, we have the KISS Fellows, which is an organization that helps bring people um, who are fresh out of their uh, degrees into the community of space research. And we also hold workshops. These workshops uh, are intended to bring experts from around the world, industry, academia, government, to Caltech to tackle some of these problems in three to five day sessions where these discussions take place and new avenues are open possibly for future technology development. Well, such a workshop is taking place right now here on campus. It is to uh, discuss what can be learned about primitive bodies in the solar system from measurements made up close and personal, touching the objects perhaps. Um, and one of the uh, co-leads for this study is here with us tonight to introduce our speaker. Uh, and she is JPL's Dr. Jordana Blacksburg. Jordana. Thank you, Dan. So it's my great pleasure tonight to introduce Jim Bell, our speaker. Dr. Jim Bell is a scientist, author, and an extremely active and prolific public communicator of science and space exploration. He's a professor in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University, an adjunct professor of astronomy at Cornell University, and the president of the Planetary Society, who's a co-sponsor of tonight's event. He's a frequent contributor to popular astronomy and science magazines like Sky and Telescope and Scientific American, and to radio shows and internet blogs about astronomy and space. He's written a number of photography-oriented books that showcase some of the most spectacular images of the solar system and beyond acquired during the space program. Those are Postcards from Mars, Mars 3D, Moon 3D, and the space book, which is coming out this May. Jim's research primarily focuses on geology, geochemistry, and mineralogy of planets, moons, asteroids, and comets using data obtained from telescopes and spacecraft missions. As an active planetary scientist, Jim has been heavily involved in many NASA robotic space exploration missions, including the near-Earth asteroid rendezvous, Mars Pathfinder, Comet Nucleus Tor, Mars Exploration Rover, Mars Odyssey Orbiter, Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the Mars Science Laboratory Rover Mission. As a member of the Mars Exploration Rover team, Jim served as the lead scientist in charge of the Panoram Panoram Camera Color stereos Stereoscopic Imaging System on the Spirit and Opportunity Rover. Jim also has a main belt asteroid named after him and was the recipient of the 2011 Carl Sagan Medal from the American Astronomical Society for Excellence in Public Communication in Planetary Sciences. So please welcome Jim Bell. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jordana, for that wonderful introduction. Thank you, Dan. Uh, let me see if I can get my slide working here. Yay, good. Uh, hello, hey everybody. Uh, hopefully we've got some Planetary Society members out there tonight, yes. 
In fact, uh, I may see the CEO of the Planetary Society, Bill Nye, right there in our audience. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I want to thank, um, thank uh, Jordana and uh, Professor John Eiler from Caltech here for organizing this wonderful workshop that we're having. Uh, like, like Dan McLeese said, uh, we do get to play once in a while, and this is great just to let your mind wander and think about all kinds of great, great topics in, uh, in solar system uh, and space science, and that's been a blast. I want to thank uh, Michelle Judd and her staff at the Keck Institute uh, for their wonderful hospitality and for inviting me to, to uh, participate in this, uh, in this public event, and hopefully we'll have a, have a good time. Uh, I'll tell you what I want to talk about. Um, I mostly these days do Mars research, Mars work, Mars operations work with the Opportunity rover and Curiosity rover. Uh, and I'll talk a lot about how that kind of work fits into this overall architecture that uh, NASA has for exploring our solar system. And the, the mantra there is, is fly by, orbit, land, rove, and return. And we'll talk about, uh, I'll talk about a short history of that process uh, in lunar exploration and how that's guiding uh, the way that we, we explore Mars, thinking about missions like Viking, Pathfinder, Phoenix, and mostly talking about the, the missions I've been heavily involved with, Spirit, Opportunity, and now Curiosity. And Opportunity is still going great. Uh, 3,237 days into our 90-day mission on Mars. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, Wonderfully, wonderfully built JPL uh, machines, and Curiosity uh, is in Sol 193 of its uh, uh, two, uh, Mars year, two Earth year mission. Uh, and, uh, and I'll talk about some of the things that both of these rovers have been doing very recently, some exciting times on Mars. And then I'll, I'll try to tie that into some of the things that my colleagues and I have been talking about at this workshop. Uh, you heard that it's about primitive bodies, it's about asteroids and comets and thinking about distant destinations in our solar system and what can we learn from exploring the moon, from exploring Mars with rovers and landers that we can apply to, uh, to the this, this study of, uh, of these other destinations in our solar system. So that's what I'm hoping to cover. We'll see if we can get through that. And uh, I told Michelle it's only a three-hour lecture, so it should be okay. <laughs> Uh, fly by orbit, land, rove, and return. Okay, this is a little kind of a matrix I made. I don't expect you to read all of this, but along this axis is our solar system, Mercury, Venus, Moon, Mars, asteroids, Jupiter, Saturn, outer satellites, Uranus, Neptune, comets, Kuiper belt objects, and extrasolar planets. On this axis is ways that we look at those objects from telescopic to spacecraft flybys, orbiters, landers, rovers, balloons, sample return, and human landing. Okay, so this is kind of like the space that we as humans are obligated to fill up, right? This is exploration. We gotta fill this grid and then we're done. <laughs> and we've done, a, we've done most of those things really well with the moon, right? You know, telescopic observations, et cetera, all the way through human landings and sample return, human and robotic sample return missions. So I'll talk about that uh, briefly in a few minutes. Uh, for Mars, we've done a lot of these things as well. Uh, of course, there's a rich telescopic history, there's been landers, there's been rovers, and there's lots of ideas about sample return, and that's what a lot of folks in uh, the NASA and JPL and other space science communities are thinking about nowadays, is how to get samples back uh, from Mars is kind of the next big step. So I'll talk about uh, uh, Mars exploration, focusing on opportunity and curiosity, and then I'll talk about asteroids, and I include just main belt asteroids, like uh, Vesta and Ceres and everything that's in the zone between Mars and Jupiter, near-Earth asteroids, things that come whizzing by our planet. And then way out in the outer solar system, these Kuiper Belt objects uh, like, uh, like, like Pluto and its uh, cousins, sisters and brothers, these are really asteroids too. They just happen to live very far from home. And they're important uh, places for us to study in our solar system because a lot of these objects are the building blocks that became the rest of the planets in our solar system, so understanding them is an important thing. And then uh, comets as well, denizens of the outer solar system. There have been a number of missions already to comets and there's lots of interest in uh, going to land on comets, a mission that's gonna do that fairly soon from the European Space Agency, and then eventually bringing some samples back. So lots of space to cover here. I'll try to use um, mostly Mars, 
uh, Moon and Mars as, uh, as examples of how we're, ways that, that we're proceeding and thinking about going out even deeper in the solar system. So here's a one slide with way too many words, a history of lunar exploration from telescopic observations through robotic missions. Look at this list of, of, uh, of robotic missions that have been out there uh, studying uh, the moon going back to the, the late 1950s all the way up until this, uh, this past year. And currently, NASA has a mission called Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter that's, that's orbiting the moon right now. And of course, human missions. And those are the ones that helped us bring back lunar samples. There's probably people in this audience who've never seen the video of Buzz and Neil landing on July 21st, 1969. This is the view out the window. The eagle has landed. When I was a kid, I had a Christmas ornament on my tree. It was a little Neil Armstrong. You push the button, it would say, Tranquility Base here, the eagle has landed. <laughs> and when I was a kid, I was watching this on TV, right? Guys bouncing around on the moon, driving a car, banging rock hammers into things, really exploring the place. Uh, this, is, uh, this is where the lunar samples came from. These missions, the Apollo missions, returned almost 400 kilograms of, of rocks and soil from the moon that have helped us to understand the, uh, the origin of the Earth-Moon system, this idea that the moon was, uh, was formed in a giant impact with the Earth from a Mars-sized body early in the history of our, our solar system. Uh, there also, and this is kind of incredible, way back in the 70s, there were three robotic missions launched by the Soviet Union that went to the moon and brought back little, little bits of, uh, of lunar uh, soil and rocks back to the Earth. So there have been robotic sample return missions as well. So when we think about trying to send robotic missions to Mars or comets or asteroids and bring samples back, it's like, well, you know what? We've got some experience that goes way back, but there is actually some experience, and to date the only um, space agency that uh, has done a robotic sample return is the was from the Soviet Union. Of course, that space agency doesn't exist anymore. Uh, but the A's are the Apollo landing sites. So the, the moon is kind of our end member case, right? We've done the telescopic, we've done the, the impacts, we've done the flybys, we've orbited, we've had uh, landers on the moon, rovers on the moon, astronauts on the moon, bringing samples back. And that entire chain of, of history is what was required to get us to where we are in our understanding of the moon. And our understanding of the moon tells us about the Earth uh, as well and the evolution of our own planet. So all of the, the analytic capabilities, all the detailed laboratory work that's done with the samples uh, that, are, uh, that are national treasures that are uh, very, very carefully curated at the Johnson Space Center in Houston, uh, many of them still uh, unopened uh, from their original containers and not uh, really studied, is that's still going on. In laboratories on the Earth, that's still going on. And the cool thing about having these samples is that you know they brought them back in 1969, 70, 71, 72, and they did what they could on them. And the technology of our laboratories on the Earth is getting better and better. So the same samples can be reanalyzed to a tenth of a percent precision instead of one percent precision, or using methods that they had no idea would even exist in 1969. Uh, and, that, and that's one of the beautiful things about bringing samples back. That's one of the reasons why people want to bring samples back from Mars, too. Uh, we can send amazing laboratories, like I'll show you with opportunity and curiosity, but we can't reproduce, you know, Professor Eiler's mass spectroscopy isotope laboratory in a shoebox. Can't do it yet. Maybe someday, but we can't do it yet. So it's, a, it's still scientifically much more valuable to uh, to be able to bring the samples back. And I'm also constantly humbled when I think about, uh, like here's a picture of, of Apollo 12 astronaut uh, Alan Bean looking at the, the Surveyor 3 spacecraft. Uh, they landed, uh, Bean and Conrad landed intrepid here within 600 meters or so of, of Surveyor 3 in the spring of 1960, uh, I think that's not 1967, that must be 1970, um, or 69. No, Surveyor 3 was sent there in April 1967, sorry. They, their job was to, to demonstrate precision landing to get close. And, uh, and they did a great job. And here's a picture of the Surveyor 3 and Apollo 12 landing site from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. 
And we're going to kind of slowly pan into it. You saw the scale there. This is about five kilometers across. And we're going to zoom into it. And I'm constantly humbled by people, uh, by, the, by the, the realization that people say, oh, we've been to the moon. We've explored the moon, right? You saw my map had those you know, six A's and those three L's. And we've got rocks that are sitting in Houston. And we can do all kinds of great laboratory work. And you know, this was done back you know, 40 years ago. It's been there, done that. And this is, this is Apollo 12. This is the landing site of Apollo 12. Here's Intrepid. Here's Surveyor 3. You can see these uh, spacecraft uh, from Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. You can see the scuff marks that the astronauts made as they're walking around, dragging their equipment cart. Here's the scale here. This is a tiny little place. You saw how I had to zoom in over 35 seconds to get into that little tiny place. And so I'm constantly humbled by the fact that exploring the moon means that we've just kind of looked at a couple little places. And so one of the things that uh, lots of folks in NASA are coming back to is that as we develop this capability to get back into deep space, you know, the space shuttle is retired, trying to get back into deep space, that uh, we can't forget that the moon still is a real interesting destination that we've only just barely uh, scratched the surface of. Uh, Mars has also been the subject of a lot of missions. Uh, this is a kind of a cool plot that I found uh, online that um, shows 40 missions that have been sent to Mars. Starting in, oh, you can't read any of this. It's, it didn't come out very well. But starting in the, in the 1960s, going around clockwise all the way up to Curiosity. And here's the current missions that have landed on the surface, two Viking landers, the Sojourner rover and its lander, Spirit, Opportunity, Phoenix, and Curiosity. And of course, Opportunity and Curiosity is still uh, working great. Uh, in a sense, Mars is somewhat of a spacecraft graveyard. Uh, about 20 of these missions have failed, and about 20 or so have been successful. It's a very difficult thing to do, uh, but a persistent effort over time has really paid off. And a lot of that effort involved going down to the surface with, with landers, in the case of Vikings in 1976, with uh, a lander and a rover, in the case of uh, Sojourner, that's about the size of a, a typical microwave oven uh, for reference in 1997. And in uh, 2008, the Phoenix lander going up to the, the polar regions. Viking was designed to do a, a series of biology experiments, a search for evidence of, of life on Mars. Did some very sensitive biology ex experiments. Didn't come up with any conclusive evidence for organic molecules or little green men or bugs or anything like that. Unfortunately, they had the disadvantage of not knowing the planet very well when they had to decide where to go. And so, you know, you can imagine there's this constant trade between the engineering and the management that wants you to land safely, so they want you to go to a parking lot, and the scientists who want to go to the top of the volcano or the bottom of the canyon or a really cool place, let's go. And that's a, you know, it's a constant trade-off. And in the case of the Vikings, it was the first time that anyone had, uh, that NASA had attempted to land on Mars. Very expensive, very capable vehicles. They chose some relatively safe and ultimately relatively boring geologic places to go to. Uh, and so maybe it's not surprising that they, they didn't uh, find a lot of uh, rich evidence for past habitability. Um, Sojourner's main goal here was just to demonstrate that mobility is a good thing. And so you can see uh, this little rover is going to kind of nuzzle up to this rock called Yogi and deploy its alpha particle x-ray spectrometer to measure the elemental chemistry of that rock. It was the first time that we'd had a little a tiny but mobile laboratory on the surface of Mars so we could measure the chemistry of rocks. It was the first time we could measure rocks, actually, because the instruments for Viking could only work with, with powdered up uh, soils, uh, very fine grain stuff. Uh, and that worked really well, pretty short mission, just about, about three months or so. But it demonstrated that, hey, mobility is a good thing because we want to be able to touch that rock and measure that rock and measure that sand dune and move around and, and act like a geologist really would out in the field, right? Helicopter drops you off, you're not just going to stand there. You're going to move around. And in Phoenix, Phoenix's job was, uh, to, was a lander, so no mobility, but to go to a place that's hard to get to up near the North Pole and test for evidence of ice in the subsurface, because there was this hypothesis, how scientists work, right? Hypothesis test, that there was ice just below this fine-grained reddish dust of Mars. And they used this, this uh, trenching tool to dig down, and lo and behold, 
found the ice, and were able to make some basic uh, chemical measurements on the soil and, and other materials in another relatively short, uh, short mission. So these are kind of precursors and kind of cementing the idea that you want to be able to do some detailed work there in the field. You want to be able to have mobility. Uh, and, uh, and that's a good way to, uh, to, to learn about an environment, an environment that we can't go to yet in case of Mars. So here's a, a, a cartoon of a spirit or opportunity, the Mars Exploration Rover, about as uh, tall as a 10-year-old kid. Uh, color cameras up here in this mast, uh, six wheels. Notice it looks a lot like Sojourner, but it's scaled up. It's about the size of a golf cart instead of a microwave oven. Uh, lots of uh, different instruments out on the arm here to measure the chemistry again, to look at some minerals, to grind and brush into the, uh, into the surface. And so these are kind of outgrowths of, of the experience from Viking and the experience from uh, Mars Pathfinder scaled up to deliver that mobility and some of that chemical and mineral capability uh, to, uh, to the surface. And they've been very, very successful uh, missions. Here's uh, the, the landing system. You probably recall they landed with this crazy airbag uh, bouncing system, which uh, I thought was insane until I saw the Sky Crane movie, which I'll show you in a minute. Uh, so Spirit was up here, drove down, and uh, has been exploring the surface. I mentioned mobility, and that has turned out to be absolutely critical to the missions of Spirit and Opportunity. Um, we were hoping that the rovers would last 90 days on Mars and that one of them would drive a kilometer or so. Uh, and uh, you know, Spirit lasted uh, 2,200 sols and drove seven point something kilometers and Opportunity is still, still alive today. And it's because of this mobility and because of the ability of rover drivers and engineers here at JPL to navigate a terrain remotely. And so you know, they would practice in computer games like this, so if Mars was made out of corrugated tin, we'd have no problem at all. <laughs> uh, but you know, this, they're basically, it's an, we're basically playing an interplanetary video game, right? We take pictures from, from yesterday, build a 3D model, drive the vehicle uh, in software in that model, and then set, send the same commands to the actual uh, vehicle. Turns out to be just a, a spectacular way to remotely control uh, a robot on another world when you've got a lot of latency. You can only talk with them once per day, so they have to uh, have, have some independence and some capability to make their own driving decisions to, to a degree. Uh, we found out that Spirit was a great hill climber. Uh, we didn't know what obstacles we would have to encounter with this vehicle, but uh, we did climb up into the Columbia Hills, measuring the chemistry of these rocks, most of them volcanic rocks like you would find in Hawaii or Iceland or northern Arizona, basaltic rocks uh, with a variety of, of, of minerals in them, in some cases lightly altered uh, by, uh, by water, in other cases not hardly altered at all. Lots of Mars is a big black sand beach like Hawaii without the palm trees and the coconuts and stuff like that. Uh, but just, you know, this is, uh, this is a, big, a big sand dune field. We had to be very careful not to get the rover into there because we know it would, it would be trapped. But we could nuzzle up to it, put the arm out, and make some measurements of this very common uh, basaltic material on Mars. And it turns out it's a common material of all the terrestrial planets as far as we can tell. So there's a, there's a common component to what it takes to build a terrestrial planet. And you know, that's, a, that's a theme that we come back to when we think about primitive bodies as well, asteroids as building blocks, uh, comets as suppliers of volatiles like water. Um, accidentally, we also discovered a whole bunch of what geochemists call alteration products, modified things take that, that, that happen when you weather those basaltic rocks, when you add water uh, and heat uh, or both. Uh, lots of really interesting uh, sulfur-rich soils in places that were only, only found because Spirit's, one of Spirit's wheels stopped working. Uh, the, the, the motor stopped working, and so we had to drive the vehicle backwards, drag that wheel through the soil, making a trench as we went. And in some places, that trench dug up these sulfur-rich or silica-rich uh, soils. And so this was like, you know, this is cool, right? Even when something goes wrong, we learn something because we wouldn't have otherwise seen this part of the subsurface or thought it particularly interesting. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And these kinds of, these kinds of 
mineral deposits are very common in places that, uh, like hydrothermal zones on the Earth, places like, like Yellowstone, uh, areas where there's water in the subsurface, where there's heat uh, modifying the material. Uh, and so, you know, Mars has, turns out, has a variety of these kinds of uh, mineral signatures formed by the interaction of water and rock. And that's what defines, in some sense, habitable environment or not. And one of the goals of Spirit and Opportunity was to figure out, hey, was this environment habitable? Uh, these two rovers weren't designed to measure organic chemistry and answer the question, was Mars inhabited? unless something got up and walked in front of the camera, then, then you'd know. But at a, at a chemical sense, in a fundamental chemical sense, they weren't designed to do that. So the best we could do is look at the geology, look at the landforms, look at the minerals, look at the chemistry, and try to figure out, you know, was there water in this environment? How much? Uh, was it acidic? Was it basic? Uh, was it neutral? What kinds of, of, of minerals are being formed? And what does that tell us about maybe the temperature of the environment, the conditions of the atmosphere? Etc. And those same kinds of mineral tests can be done all over the solar system uh, with the same kind of equipment or equipment built on this, these, kinds of, um, these kinds of systems. And in fact, Curiosity, as I'll show you, has uh, an instrument suite that's partly based on what spirit and opportunity took and what, uh, what those missions found. And so a lot of the instruments and a lot of the data that we get that helps us answer these questions, whether it be Mars, the moon, primitive bodies, is what I call squiggly line science, okay? And you wanna have a good time, come to our workshop and look at our squiggly line science plots, because it is a blast. Actually, I dig this stuff, a bunch of us do, right? Uh, I don't have any isotope plots up here, that would excite even more people in our audience. Uh, but, you know, we can use the cameras to take pictures, but we can also use them as spectrometers by spinning their filter wheels. We have an infrared spectrometer that gives us squiggly lines that tell us something about the kinds of minerals that are on the surface. We have this, this X-ray instrument that tells us how much silicon, chlorine, calcium, iron, nickel, the elements that go into forming those different minerals, and that can be moved around in a watery aqueous solution or other uh, weathering environments. And another spectrometer that specifically tells us about the iron-bearing minerals, because we know Mars is the red planet because of uh, the presence of oxidized iron. Uh, so, a lot of the science that's come out of these missions, even though the pictures are beautiful and I am the first person in line to love all of them, a lot of the best science comes from this kind of stuff. It's really the detailed quantitative analytic tools that you send to a planetary surface that augment the pictures. And in fact, the, the imaging, lots of times, we took the pictures so that we could get these tools into the right place. So even though many of the pictures are beautiful, lots of times their function is operational support get that spectrometer into the best possible place to make the most detailed measurement. Uh, it's a hostile environment in a number of ways, very, very uh, low temperature, a very low uh, atmospheric pressure, and it's also a pretty dusty place. That was the Spirit rover when we landed, nice shiny blue solar panels. By three years later, the solar plant panels are getting more and more dusty, and by six years later, it's really hard to find the rover <laughs> against the background. And this is our power. This is where we get our power to run everything on, on spirit and opportunity. And so uh, this is what ultimately uh, killed spirit, is very, very dusty solar panels, another broken wheel, getting stuck in some of that soft sand. All of that conspired to end spirit's mission in, uh, in 2010. But it was a spectacular, spectacular rover life, well lived, uh, well beyond the 90-day uh, the mission of that, that vehicle. Yeah, let's hear it for spirit. Meanwhile, Spirit has this twin uh, opportunity on the other side of the planet that is now 3,227 days in, uh, landing in January 2004, and visiting craters has been the theme of this, this mission because the, the plains here that we landed in, in Meridiani Planum, are relatively flat, sand dune covered plains, and it's only by getting into the craters that have formed these natural road cuts, digging up the subsurface, exposing it to view that we can really study this place. So we landed in a small crater, drove over to a bigger one, drove over to a bigger one, drove over to a bigger one, and that's where we are today, roughly at that star, and we're studying this crater called Endeavor, which is 20-something uh, kilometers across, because from orbit, 
And remember, NASA has these wonderful orbiters up there taking all kinds of remote sensing data from orbit. We can see clay mineral deposits in this part of Mars. And like, like those sulfates and silica that I showed before for spirit, clay minerals are formed from the alteration of some precursor like, like volcanic rock under certain kinds of watery conditions, certain pH, certain temperature, et cetera. So we can see their signature from orbit in pixels you know, the size of this room, and we want to drive up there and see what the surface expression of these materials is like and what they can tell us about uh, the past environment. And now we've, we're actually in our 10th year. We started our 10th year of operations uh, on Mars with opportunity just in, in January. 35 and a half kilometers of driving. Whew, crazy, crazy. Um, going way back to January 2004, this is where we landed. I mentioned it was in a small crater. Uh, this is uh, Eagle Crater. It's about the size of this room across. Okay. Uh, kind of made a mess in here. But we knew this was going to be a special mission right when we landed because we could see this outcrop in the wall of the crater, this light-toned, layered outcrop rock. And that is a holy grail word to geologists. If you have geologist friends, if you're at a party with geologists, just kind of mumble outcrop, and people will turn. <laughs> they will. I'm not kidding. And so it was really cool. It was the first time we'd seen outcrop on Mars. It wasn't just all dust and, and piles of, uh, of, of random rocks thrown around by impacts. And so getting over to that and studying rock formed in place is a big deal. It's a big deal for the astronauts on the moon when they can do it. You learn something about that, the, the environment and the, the formation of those materials. It'll be a big deal if we can find material like that on, on comets and, and primitive bodies as well, if they're not covered with these fluffy, uh, dusty, regolith materials. And so there's a lot of debate about that and a lot of discussion at workshops like ours and other places of how to, how to get to this, this good juicy stuff and get below the, the frou-frou dust that might be, uh, might be on top. So you can see we made a real mess. And the other cool thing that we found uh, in this soil were, the, were these blueberries, right? They're, they're less red. They're red, but they're less red than the soil. So to astronomers, less red is blue. And so that's why they got called blueberries. They're not really blue. But they're these spherical grains that are you know, one centimeter, two, uh, one uh, millimeter, two, three, four millimeters across, uh, kind of like ball bearings, and they just litter the ground. And so this was, this was a real mystery. Uh, just by taking pictures of them, it's impossible to know what they are, because there's a variety of, of uh, spherical, rocky kinds of things that occur in nature that we find on our own planet. Some of them formed by volcanoes and glassy. Some of them are formed by impact craters on our planet and others. Some of them are formed by the, the weathering of, of rocks in the watery environments. Very, very hard to know. And so we had to figure out, not from pictures, but from our squiggly line instruments, what these things were. And we found a place where we could see a little depression where a bunch of them had rolled into. And so we could make a series of measurements in the depression, brush off a piece of the rock nearby with, with very few of them, make a measurement here, and look at a differential. And that's what this is. This is a Mossbauer spectrum, and you don't really need to know what it's doing, but you can, you can just look at the difference between the red and the blue. Okay? The red is the, the data on this berry bowl loaded with these blueberries, and the blue is without. Okay, so the difference is that something in the berries is causing these big red peaks, and it turns out that's the, the mineral hematite, Fe203. Uh, we could see that in the infrared spectrum as well. So we could make a detailed mineral identification of this stuff, then compare that to the kinds of little circular features that we see on the Earth, and that's what allowed us to come up with this, this hypothesis that these little blueberries are materials called concretions, which are formed like kind of like stalactites and stalagmites in a cave from watery solution with, with, uh, with iron or other uh, cations in it, and that, that iron slowly precipitates out of solution. And if everything is nice and calm and even, or isotropic and homogeneous, <laughs> and I can say that for a Caltech audience, isotropic and homogeneous, you're with me? Yes. Then the, the precipitant material grows spherically into these little, little spheres. And so that's the hypothesis, which implied that there was a ton of water there coursing through very porous rock and a, a, some kind of a groundwater system, maybe even a surface water system based on some of the features that we saw on the surface. And so we could go to places like uh, Endurance Crater, which is an even deeper hole in the ground, and look at the walls of the crater and look at these beautiful layers of altered sandstone 
that are loaded with all those little blueberries. And it tells us that there was a bunch of groundwater coursing through this system. Uh, we can measure the chemistry as we went down into the crater. We looked at the chemistry with, the, with those squiggly line instruments and look at how conditions are changing with depth and really learn a lot about uh, the details of this environment. This is actually, it's really hard to imagine, but this is uh, just an insane place for opportunity to have been. I'm so impressed with the JPL folks to get us here. We're inside this uh, 100 meter, you know, rose bowl size hole in the ground, and we're up on the edge of the crater at about a 20 degree angle, precariously on this plywood surface covered with BBs, looking over our shoulder, taking pictures and making measurements. Just an absolutely crazy place to be. But if we were geologists in the field, we'd run to that place. And this is what we told our engineering and rover driver friends. That's where we need to go. And they got us there because we had that mobility and because they have a test rover up at the Mars yard in Pasadena that they were putting on these flagstones with BBs and testing it out, you know, um, and, uh, and making it work. So having, having mobility is, was, has been, continues to be just absolutely crucial. Uh, we're driving around on the rim of that big uh, Endeavor crater that I showed you. This is a piece of the ancient rim of that crater that's sticking up uh, from the surrounding plains. We, we had a several year drive to get here from Victoria Crater, driving around on this rim across uh, to the south side. We had to park opportunity up here on this northern slope during the last Martian winter because the rover's getting dusty, solar power's getting low, and like a lizard, we had to park this thing into the sun to stay warm and keep, keep enough power during the winter. Uh, did some science there, and now that we're back into uh, summertime, we could go to the south side, and we're driving around here, taking a series of uh, kind of a walkabout, we're calling it, looking for the ground evidence for those clays that we see from orbit. We're in those pixels now that we've seen the clay minerals uh, from orbit, and that's what we're, we've been doing uh, lately. Finding some pretty cool stuff, these uh, beautiful little veins going through the, the rock, uh, looking at them with the pan cam, looking at them with the microscopic imager. Uh, we see evidence that they're hydrated, that they're loaded with calcium and sulfur. And so the hypothesis is that we're looking at a gypsum vein, that there was a, a, a groundwater hydrothermal perhaps system, or at least a, some kind of a, a, a way to transport material through the ground, through cracks in the rocks uh, at some point in the distant past. Uh, so this may also have been a, a habitable environment. And these, unlike the sulfur minerals that we'd seen earlier at Eagle Crater or uh, the ones that we saw in Gusev, these are more characteristic of, of more neutral, uh, less, less acidic uh, kinds of waters. So, uh, so some real interesting information about environmental conditions coming out of this. We found a new class of blueberries. Um, nobody knew what to call them, so Steve Squires calls them new berries. Uh, because they don't, they don't look like the blueberries we saw before. Uh, they're, not, they're not homogeneous inside. They, they have concentric rims on many of them. Many of them occur in two, doubles or triples, and sometimes they're clumped together like this piece of blueberry pie here that we saw in one of the rocks. We don't know what these things are yet. We're actively, part of our walkabout is trying to figure out what these things are and how are they related to these clay mineral deposits. So we're, we're driving around up here now. We're looking at these uh, uh, wonderfully, this is a false color image, uh, bluish coated rocks with these rinds on them. Maybe this is the clay bearing material. We tested, uh, testing that hypothesis on a, on a bunch of uh, uh, chemical and mineral measurements. And this is a picture that just uh, came down last night. Uh, we're at a place called Maylee in, in our walkabout and we're uh, looking at some of these um, relatively clean um, uh, striated exposures of rock, measuring the chemistry of this material as well. A lot of geologic mapping being done, a lot of uh, testing the chemistry and mineralogy of these different geologic units, the same kinds of things we would do uh, out in the field, or our graduate students would do out in the field. Uh, and, um, but we're remote, you know, and, and it takes a month to do what we could probably do in you know, a couple of hours, in an afternoon. Uh, but that's the situation we're in. Uh, with, uh, with uh, rovers and landers on Mars. And it's likely to be the situation that we're in with rovers and landers even farther out in the uh, outer solar system as well. Now, opportunity is getting dusty as well. I mentioned uh, starting to look more like Spirit at the end of its mission. Power levels are still better than they were uh, for Spirit, so we think we still have a, a bright and long future ahead of us, but we are getting dustier with time. 
So we know our days are, are limited. We're trying to do the best job we can where we are now while it's summertime because we can already hear the clock ticking for when we have to park for next winter. So we know that there's only a limited amount of stuff that we can do. Um, one of my favorite um, Spirit and Opportunity photos from, from Spirit, and uh, I'll just, just read this. The real voyage of discovery consists not in seeing new landscapes, but in having new eyes. And that's what Spirit and Opportunity have done for us. They've given us new eyes and new noses and new fingers, you know, new senses, new ways to, to touch that environment. And they have been the inspiration for this monster truck, uh, Curiosity, which is uh, now uh, 193 days on Mars, based on the basic design of Spirit and Opportunity, six rovers, independent uh, uh, motors, power steering, power brakes, the whole NASA luxury package. Um, mast up here, except it's two meters high, so taller than most people. Uh, with a very, very capable arm, with a whole a package of more robust instruments and a drill on that arm. Uh, I'll talk more about that in a bit. But, uh, you know, designed to be the follow-on to Spirit and Opportunity, as you can imagine, based on that experience. Designed to visit a place where we had to land precisely to get to a bunch of interesting mineral deposits, sulfates, clays, there's other iron oxides in here. There's a, what looks like an ancient riverbed fan from orbit laid down where we, we wanted to land. And getting up into these materials here, driving here up into this mountain of sedimentary rocks. And sedimentary rocks are, in, the, in this case, these beautiful layered uh, rocks, and layers are another holy grail to geologists. If you see layers in the Grand Canyon or San Gabriel Hills, wherever, that means something has changed. Deposition, erosion, climate change, environmental change of some kind, uh, catastrophe, whatever. Something has changed with time. And there's a book waiting to be read here about much of the history of Mars, from ancient Mars at the bottom of the stack of sediments, all the way up to the very, very top, if we could possibly make it there, where dust is settling onto the surface today. You know, so. Curiosity, Curiosity's mission is to learn as much as possible about uh, ancient Mars and its habitability by studying a place where a lot of that record is preserved uh, in the sediments. Um, I may not have time, I didn't know if I'd have time to show this or not, but I have the, um, the landing, piece of the landing video that you've all seen from six months ago. But do you want to see it again? Yeah. All right, I'll show it again. And I put kind of a cool soundtrack on it too, so. Um, and I think Lenny Kravitz would like this, actually. Is Lenny in the audience? Is that... <laughs> okay. Um, so I mentioned that, you know, those of us involved with Spirit and Opportunity thought, thought the airbags were crazy until we saw this. And that's true. This, this vehicle, uh, this, this uh, back shell, aero shell, is larger than the one that brought the astronauts back from the moon. It's the largest... Uh, uh, you know, aerodynamic structure of its kind that, that NASA has ever made. And it's got that rover inside, and that rover is kind of mini Cooper size, so scaled up from spirit and opportunity. Had to stay protected from the, uh, the at thin atmosphere, but traveling at five, six kilometers per second. You can see the little jets and thrusters trying to keep it uh, aligned. You can see it throwing off ballast mast here, which makes me cry every time I see that. There's entire missions made out of that ballast mass. Uh, big parachute. Uh, so a lot of this is just like Viking, just like Pathfinder, just like Phoenix, just like Spirit, just like Opportunity, uh, to get safely through the atmosphere, use the parachute as much as you can, uh, and then, then we go off the rails. Uh, then it gets kind of crazy, uh, more Viking-like, because we're not using airbags, the vehicle is too heavy, we just crush those airbags. So they use this uh, propulsive jetpack technology to, to keep everything stable, this radar here that's pinging the surface, uh, looking for, uh, to set the timing of all the, the different events at the end game. Um, they're gonna, sh I guess this zooms into, there was a, a camera uh, built by Mike Malin and his crew down in San Diego that was taking time-lapse pictures at four frames per second of the, the landing. Uh, we knew that we'd only get those pictures back if it landed safely, so that was a little bit risky. And then this is the sky crane. This is the part where we all laughed in the science group when we saw this for the first time. It's like, you guys are kidding. You just made this up, right? 
Um, but you know, you don't, they didn't want to uh, have these jets come all the way down to the surface and, and, and fry the rover. The, the rover. Uh, very, very scary to have to land on the mobility system. We all of us know how important mobility is, but we land on the mobility system and then, uh, then it flies away and, and explodes over here. And they don't show that in the movie. Look, they, uh, they cut it out. <laughs> I really want them, I gotta talk to Doug Ellison, make a version of the movie that shows the explosion. The kids love that stuff. <laughs> so, oh my God, it worked, right? Yeah, isn't that cool? And this is what it looked like if you were riding on the spacecraft. This is the movie that we got down. There's the heat shield coming off. Here's the dunes that we could see in, uh, in Gale Crater at the base of that big mountain. And so this was actually put together by, uh, by an amateur uh, using the JPEGs that were uh, released onto the internet. Uh, the full resolution, highest quality movie is still not completely downlinked from the rover. There's just these enormous HD images uh, with very little or no compression to them. And so that's, that's still coming down as we can like, sort of slowly, uh, slowly downlink it at very low priority compared to other data products. So you can see it kind of wobbling on the parachute here. We got our three body problem, right? Wobbling back and forth, um, getting closer to the surface, uh, worrying about these sand dunes, even though we couldn't, if we'd seen these movies in real time, we would have freaked, I'm sure. Ah, we're gonna end up in the middle of the sand dunes. We're not gonna be able to land safely. Um, but the vehicle knows what attitude it's coming in at. It's inertially guiding itself. It's got uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the knowledge of its location uh, and the conditions as it's coming in stored on board and uh, with a system designed to, to uh, then actively thrust once we come off the parachutes. And you'll see a transition here uh, once that, there we go. So now much more smoothly moving across the terrain not on the parachute anymore, now we're on the, the jet pack. It knows uh, where to head. We had a specific center of the landing ellipse that we wanted to get to in a relatively smooth part uh, of this terrain. You can see it is kind of rugged. There are craters, there are little mesas and hills. Uh, we get up to the surface, the sky crane comes out, the dust starts flying around, boom. Now we're down on the surface. Hey, that was pretty cool, huh? The, uh, that just fascinates me. Um, I, I don't know if there's anyone on the entry, descent, and landing team here, but you're my hero if you are. Uh, these are you know, the folks that work right over here in La Cañada, and uh, just they do amazing things. And this is one of the most incredible things that NASA has, has ever done, getting down to the surface safely, getting those first pictures back that night. Many of you probably saw, you can see uh, Mount Sharp, that, that mountain in Gale Crater just off on the horizon. We, could, uh, we can use a more capable rover than Spirit and Opportunity because it has many of the capabilities that those rovers have as a geologist. Uh, ca cameras, wheels, uh, brushing tool, uh, some elemental chemistry tools, but it also has some tools that an astrobiologist would take and a mineralogist would take, an X-ray diffraction instrument an organic chemistry and isotope laboratory on board. Things that were just too big to fit at the time into spirit and opportunity, but could be squeezed into a bigger class vehicle that fit into that, that back shell. So uh, 10 or 11 scientific instruments, a much more capable laboratory uh, for science. And that's um, and just like spirit and opportunity, many of these instruments generate squiggly lines, and that's where a lot of the action is in terms of figuring out what the environment's like. Uh, it was kind of interesting when we, when we landed, we could see the, the scour marks that were made by the, the sky crane jets uh, on the surface. Uh, and so, you know, it was, a, it was a good thing those things weren't pointing down, but still it was, it was a very violent environment. You can see rocks and pebbles up on the deck here. I mean, there was this crazy cloud of dust and debris that actually broke one of the little wind sensors on the, ro on the rover's mast. There was two of them, so it's okay, we'll figure it out. Uh, but it was just a, a really crazy kind of landing environment. And from orbit, uh, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter camera can see those scour marks, can see the whole area around the rover kind of darkened because the dust was blown away. And you can see us driving away our tracks here. Uh, it's great having a spy satellite at Mars to uh, provide us with some <laughs> geologic context. So getting down on the ground, here's some of those scour marks. There's the beautiful slopes of Mount Sharp 
with the low resolution camera, and when we go to the high resolution camera, uh, this picture literally made some of my geology colleagues on the team weep. It was really cool. It's really cool to see people weep. <laughs> um, and I can't blame them, right? It's beautiful, it's spectacular. This is exactly the kind of environment that a geologist wants to go to if you wanna figure out the history of a place. We gotta get here and drive up there and look at all the layers we're gonna go through. Look at all the, the those pages of the book that we're going to read. And it's very difficult to tell scale here, but that little dot is the size of the rover, okay? So this is an enormous pile of sedimentary material, four or five kilometers high. Uh, the top of this mound goes above the walls of the crater in places. So one hypothesis is that the entire crater was filled with this stuff, that this is some enormous sedimentary uh, de debris that's scattered across much of Mars. And there are lots of other craters that look like this too that have these kinds of mounds in them. And so by studying this place well, we hope uh, we can learn a lot about the history of, of lots of Mars. Well, we haven't gotten to the base of this mountain yet, but we, we're, we're about to start heading there, and our prediction is we can probably get up into you know, these lower layers at least where we see a lot of those interesting mineral signatures uh, by the end of our one Mars year mission. And if we can keep going, we certainly will. Uh, here's uh, kind of a self-portrait. There's a, a beautiful color camera on the arm that can turn around and take a picture of the, the mast with our two mast cameras, the navigation cameras here, and the chem cam. This is our laser, uh, laser ablation, laser chemistry experiment here. And, and pictures like this have, been, have become iconic. They're being used by uh, Andy Warhol wannabes to uh, <laughs> make some art. And this is kind of cool too. <laughs> like this one. Kind of like that. That's a good one. I like that. Mars as art, right? Why not? We got to our first, uh, we, after landing and checking out the instruments, we did the initial checkouts for the, the chem cam. This is our laser instrument. We fire a laser beam at a rock. A rock was identified, targeted here as a, a place where we could fire the laser beam. It, it, it vaporizes a, a piece of the rock. That vapor cloud expands. It's super hot plasma. It emits emission lines at a spectrometer measures and we can get the chemistry out of it. It's kind of a cool thing. And when we fired the first laser shot, there's, <laughs> yes, yes. That's the way to explore space, yes. <laughs> no, 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 no. That made a tiny little tiny pit in the rock. It's a couple of hundred microns across, okay. It's, it is a, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a technique used often in, in terrestrial laboratories. It's used on art, paintings, and things, because it, it, it's destructive, but tiny destructive. It makes a tiny little hole. And you can take that, that laser, that plasma, and see all these beautiful uh, elemental lines. Uh, so just like having that, that X-ray instrument on the arm of Spirit and Opportunity, and Curiosity has one as well, we don't have to put that instrument down onto a rock or a soil to make a measurement. We can do it remotely. So this really speeds things up because it takes a long time to figure out exactly how to put the instrument onto a rock or a soil. And here we can just do that remotely, zap, 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 zap. So every day we may do two, three, four different spots and get the chemistry. So we're building up a, quickly this statistical data set of this beautiful squiggly line science that tells us about the, uh, the chemistry. Uh, mobility has been already been critically important on Curiosity, and it will continue to be uh, critically important just as it has been on Spirit and Opportunity. This is taking the, the arm camera and giving us the dog's eye view underneath the belly, uh, looking at our, our wheels and our, our undercarriage, something we could not do uh, with uh, Spirit and Opportunity cameras. Uh, and here's uh, our, right after our first drive uh, away from, there's the scour marks from the the retro rockets. This is the, uh, our first mobility uh, on Mars. So hooray, we could drive. We knew we weren't gonna be a lander, which was wonderful. Uh, and what really uh, got me about this picture, it hadn't, you know, the whole sky crane thing, it's like, oh, that's kinda cool. Uh, I really hadn't, really hadn't fully captured the magnitude of what, what these men and women did at JPL. Because I was expecting there to be like these big, divots where the wheels came boosh, down like this and maybe slid around and you know some some little mounds of debris but no it was just gently set there just so beautifully gently set there it's just spectacular 
and they did a great job. So that's when it really sunk in when I, when I saw that. Everybody's like, wow, that's amazing. What an achievement. They got us there in one piece. So now it's our job on the science side to do some really good, some cool stuff. Uh, the place we landed, uh, we call it Bradbury Landing, uh, after uh, our, our friend and Planetary Society friend, Ray Bradbury, science fiction author, a uh, great all-around human being. Uh, and we drove, actually, Mount Sharp is that way, so we drove that way. Um, we realized that we're very close to this point where three different kinds, the three main kinds of terrain around us all got together. And so with a relatively short drive, we realized we could, we could do a couple of hopefully quick studies and learn about everything we need to know about our landing site, get that all in the can, and then head off uh, to the mountain. And so that was, the, that was the goal, spend the first part of the mission where our engineering friends were gonna be checking out instruments and systems anyway. We couldn't do a lot of science uh, during this initial few months of the mission because it had to go through all these engineering checkouts. So let's just try to do some limited amount of work and then head for the hills, literally. And so it was along this drive that we started seeing these, these uh, beautiful, uh, almost looks like a, a cement slab in your backyard, right? Uh, hey, let's go, let's go get rid of the basketball court, right? Get me a jackhammer. Uh, and another example of it here, these beautiful rocks that geologists call conglomerates, rounded pebbles in here, making up this kind of a cemented uh, material. We don't know what the cement is in here. When we were making these, taking these pictures, the ChemCam instrument wasn't ready to use yet, and we had to keep kind of driving on. We didn't want to just stop and wait for a couple of weeks. Uh, so we hopefully will go back across some of this kind of terrain and get at that kind of cement. But this is some evidence that tells us, yeah, there really was this, this river fan of alluvial material coming down. If there was water flowing across the surface, transporting these grains, rounding them, they're way too big to be moved by the wind. Only water could do that and round them at the same time and cement them into this, uh, this like riverbed uh, sedimentary rock. Pretty exciting interesting discovery that tells us instantly, hey, you know what? This really was a watering environment. We really did come to the right place. There's gonna be some really interesting stories to learn here. So we've started using the, the instruments on the turret at the end of the arm. These are uh, pictures by the mass camera of the instruments at the end of the arm. And this, this, this package of instruments on the end of the arm is about the same size as the entire rover from Mars Pathfinder, right? It's just this amazing collection of of instruments that measure the chemistry, that um, uh, take microscopic images, that have a, a brush that can clean the surface off, that have a drill that can uh, drill into the surface. And so these all have, have been checked out uh, over the last uh, few months. Here's a little uh, animation from the rover drivers of how the arm moves around. This is sped up by 100 times. Uh, putting the, in this case, we're putting the APXS onto a, a rock here, taking pictures of it. I just love the various you know, crazy machinations and twists and turns. It's, it's like this you know, Rube Goldberg thing to, to stow the arm. Then we're gonna drive off here. And in this particular case, they were using a kind of drive that would go a meter or so and take some pictures and look for obstacles. And so that's why it's kind of, <laughs> you know, <laughs> would have been kind of funny to watch if we were you know, there. Uh, and they're testing out different drive modes and eventually they'll you know, unshackle the vehicle, let it drive itself a little farther, let it use its onboard intelligence as best it can. Uh, but we're learning, and, and our engineering friends are learning along with us. Uh, we got to a place where they wanted to test out the system for um, getting material from the drill into the instruments inside the rover, the X-ray diffraction instrument and the organic chemistry set. So the engineers wanted to find a nice, loose, um, sorted material, so find a little sand dune uh, to dig into, and there's a little scoop on the end of the, uh, the turret, and so the scoop was used to dig these little, little mini trenches, they're only, you know, that big, little tiny trenches into the sand, digging up some of this stuff, getting it into the system, and testing the whole sample chain, running it through, including making detailed uh, mineral measurements and search for, uh, for organics. This turns out to be, to no one's surprise, kind of typical garden variety uh, volcanic rock like the sand dunes that we saw at Spirit site or the Meridiani site, very common across Mars with a little bit of uh, iron three plus bearing dust mixed in 
uh, to the top. Uh, no, no, no strong evidence, none expected for organic molecules or anything particularly crazy. Uh, it was kind of a nice test to do. Let's go and measure something that we think we know the answer we should get, that the engineers need to run through the system to clean it out and test everything. And lo and behold, we got the answer that we expected, but at a much nicer fidelity, and including some information we hadn't gotten from previous missions about some of the minerals in here that can't be measured with, uh, with some of the instruments on Spirit and Opportunity or, or the orbiters very well. And so that was a really good system uh, and a good test of the system that we went through. Uh, and then the last thing to test most recently has been the drill. And so uh, we found a place, uh, it's kind of at the topographic low nearby, the lowest point in this uh, basin that we're in, where we could see some relatively nice flat sort of flagstone-like materials. Found a nice one that had a, a good uh, a smooth exposure and drilled into it. Did the first drilling on Mars by Curiosity. Pretty exciting stuff. First we made a little tiny test hole, and then we drilled this really big hole. It's about six centimeters deep. <laughs> but it's the biggest hole ever drilled on Mars. Woo! <laughs> uh, it, it produced a whole bunch of, of tailings that came out, and the drill has kind of a little Archimedes screw mechanism on it, and it pulls that, that, that powder up into the drill, up into a canister, which can then be manipulated into the scoop, which can then be manipulated into a sieve, shake, 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 down into the rubber body instruments. And so what is happening right now is actually yesterday, they, they did the successful uh, transfer to the scoop, getting ready to sieve, and hopefully by this weekend, by this weekend, we will have our first mineral analysis of an interesting rock on Mars that we don't know what the answer is. There's all these little veins running through this rock, suggesting that there was water coursing through this that may have sulfates in, or other minerals in it. It's this kind of grayish, uh, bluish powder to the inside, so it's not some just heavily dust you know, dusty material. It's something interesting, we think. We've got a little betting pool going among the team about what it is, and uh, we'll find out. We'll find out soon enough. The data will hopefully come down this weekend. The team will have to chew on it for a while, and there'll be some arguments, and then there'll be a press conference, and we'll all figure out, we'll all hear what it is. And then, so once we finish that, and maybe another drill hole or two, depending on what the results are, and if the engineers are happy with the performance of the system, we'll travel from our little location close to Bradbury here to the base of the mound. And that trip is gonna take some time. Uh, these driving technologies are gonna have to advance, we hope, but uh, that'll hopefully get us you know, six months to a year, maybe, get to the base of the mound and do the actual mission that uh, we set out to do in those sedimentary layers. So we're ready to do it. <laughs> Got some good friends helping us out, and uh, hopefully it'll all, uh, all go well. And of course, uh, Curiosity and Opportunity are active on Mars. They're part of a program that NASA and JPL have. There's an orbiter that's gonna study the atmosphere that's launching later this year. The Europeans are gonna launch an orbiter and a, a lander the next couple of opportunities. There'll be a, a lander that uh, NASA uh, sends to Mars in 2016 to look for Mars quakes and do other geophysics. And then uh, NASA just announced that there's going to be a rover in 2020. Uh, the science goals are being set for that uh, right now. And so we'll be getting hopefully a nice continuous stream of vehicles uh, to the planet heading towards, everyone believes, getting a robotic sample back, getting another X in that matrix that we have to fill out as human beings, getting this X in here. That's our next job on Mars. Uh, I'm running a little long, but let me just very quickly talk about small bodies and how the things that we're doing in this workshop relate to some of the stuff we're doing on Mars and other planets, asteroids and comets, the, the, uh, the starting materials of the solar system. This is a great uh, gallery put together by uh, Emily Lakdawalla of Planetary Society, showing a whole bunch of small asteroids and Lutetia, the largest one visited until recently, and comet nuclei much smaller than typical asteroids. And this asteroid right here, Lutetia, is this one right here, and this is Vesta, one of the largest asteroids in the main belt, now uh, having just recently been studied by the, by the Dawn mission, which is going uh, on to, uh, to Ceres 
very soon. They're irregularly shaped bodies. They're heavily cratered. They have ancient surfaces. Some of them have moons. Some of them have enormous craters uh, in them. We've sent orbiters. Uh, like the NEAR mission to study some of them up, up close and, and personal. And this mission actually landed on the surface at the end. Uh, that spacecraft did. Uh, the Japanese sent a little a, a spacecraft called Hayabusa to a tiny 500 meter long near Earth asteroid called Itokawa. It touched the surface and then sprung back up, trying to capture some dust from the surface. And about 1,500 grains of dust came back in their sample return capsule. And those are being actively studied by uh, meteorite experts and lunar sample experts and planetary scientists all, all around the world. So we've been talking a lot about what, what would we do with samples from other small bodies and how do we get samples from the distant outer solar system? What kinds of landers and rovers might we want to take? Uh, we care about asteroids because sometimes they hit the Earth. Uh, asteroid expected to make close pass to Earth in 2028, says the New York Times. And then the Post comes back and says, no, kiss your asteroid goodbye. <laughs> that will miss. Uh, so, you know, there can be some media hype in these, but you know what? Hey, folks, you know, hello, once in a while. Um, these are incredible. This, of course, was just, you know, a couple of days ago. Uh, on the same day, coincidentally, that a different little asteroid passed between the Earth and the Moon, a big chunk of something, perhaps, perhaps a comet, because most of it burned up in the upper atmosphere, but maybe a small asteroid uh, uh, flies over uh, Chelyabinsk. Um, uh, coincidence that it happened to be the same day a little asteroid passed between the Earth and the Moon? Yes, coincidence. Coincidence that it happened to be in the same city that the first conference on planetary defense from asteroids was held? Yes, coincidence. <laughs> Look at, I mean, this is incredible stuff. And, um, you know, some of, these, some of these pictures are just amazing. And you're probably asking yourself the same question that I'm asking myself. Why do all these Russians have dashboard cameras? <laughs> I don't understand. So these things do hit the Earth. Sometimes they're little, sometimes they're big. And we need to figure out what they're like, partly because of planetary defense. So one of the next missions coming up, called OSIRIS-REx, it'll launch in 2016. NASA will send a small spacecraft to a nearby asteroid uh, and land on the surface, or at least touch the surface briefly, and collect a bunch of that material, put it in a canister, and get it back uh, to the Earth. And so a small asteroid has been identified, uh, one that is part of a population that travels close to the Earth, so it could be potentially threatening to us. And this mission will hopefully bring back a bunch of, you know, handful of samples, which is a ton to uh, geochemists, and, uh, and allow us to figure out more about what this is like. The, the spacecraft will take pictures and other measurements, remote sensing of the asteroid as well. So that's going to be pretty cool. And then comets we know a bunch about too, and we visited uh, Halley's Comet and four others over the last uh, few decades. Uh, there's the, the heart of a comet, the nucleus, turns out to be a very small icy body. When we see spectacular comets in the sky or through telescopes, they look like this with this bright coma here. And, and these, you know, hundreds to thousands of kilometers across. But what's inside there, what's at the heart of this, is only a few kilometers across. These are, this is maybe five kilometers. Halley's maybe 10 to 12 kilometers long. So there's small icy bodies that are, you know, evaporating in the sunlight. And they've been studied up close by orbiters and flybys. A mission called Deep Impact launched a copper projectile into one on purpose in 2005. Boom! digging through this dark layer of, of organic and, and um, carbonaceous residue, exposing all these, a bunch of ices and organic molecules from inside. Uh, it's a pretty spectacular uh, set of results. So trying to figure out what they're like. We can do some things remotely, uh, but now we're starting to think about landing on their surfaces, figuring out what they're like, measuring their chemistry directly, eventually trying to get a sample uh, back to the Earth. Uh, Comets are going to be in the news later this year. There's a, many of you know that a comet called ISON has been discovered that's on a, on a, a course that will take it very close to the Earth. Um, not going to hit the Earth, but it'll be very close, and it's predicted to potentially be another spectacular comet of the century, like Hale-Bopp or Hayakutake was, those of you who remember. Of course, these predictions can go either way. We don't know. <laughs> Uh, it's also going to coincidentally pass very close to Mars. Uh, and so we will try to take pictures of it with curiosity and opportunity. 
uh, before it happens to pass by the Earth. Uh, the Europeans have a, a wonderful, exciting set of plans uh, for the mission they call Rosetta, which launched back in 2004, and it's on course to, to visit, to orbit, and rendezvous a comet called churyumov gerasimenko or CG, in, uh, in a couple of years, or next year, actually, later next year, and it will send a small lander to the surface that will take pictures, it'll do compositional measurements, elemental chemistry, uh, it'll look at magnetic fields, maybe it takes some geophysical kind of measurements. It'll be the first time that we've sent something to the surface of a comet. It won't bring anything back for us, but it'll make those initial uh, measurements, which will be really exciting. Lots of plans for future landers and rovers. The Chinese are in the game with plans to send a couple of lunar rovers in the next few years. The Japanese will send another mission back to a small near-Earth asteroid and send a, a, little, a couple little rovers to land. Uh, on that asteroid. They had sent one to the previous mission, but it, it failed. Uh, the Europeans are going back to Mars with a rover in a few years. NASA's going back to Mars with another MSL-class rover. The Indians are going back to the moon with a, a possible lander in a couple of years. There's ideas for international lunar networks. There's plenty of opportunities, hopefully plenty of opportunities coming up for future small and medium-class missions to the moon or asteroids or comets provided by NASA over the next decade. And then there may be even landers and rovers specifically designed to support future human missions as we develop that capability to go beyond low Earth orbit. So this is my last slide. I'll just put it up here and remind everyone that you can follow along if you want to follow along what's going on on Mars, if you want to uh, look at Mars rover pictures to wallpaper your bathroom, uh, go to the PanCam site. And if you want to follow along with all kinds of cool things going on in the solar system, please visit the Planetary Society's website. Um, and, uh, and enjoy the great stories and pictures and blogs that go on there. Uh, I want to thank the Planetary Society again for co-sponsoring, KISS Institute for, for co-sponsoring this talk and inviting me uh, tonight. I uh, really am enjoying this workshop, looking forward to thinking about the future of rovers and landers on other planets, and hopefully all of you will follow along in this great adventure. Thank you. Oh. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm happy to take uh, some questions, and apparently we've been streaming this online, and have a, uh, and I'd, I'd ask you to go to the microphones if you have some questions. And there's a question from an online listener who says, opportunity is going to break the all-time planetary distance record very soon. This is the distance traveled by a rover uh, on another planet. Uh, opportunities competing with uh, the Apollo lunar rovers and with the Lunacods that the, the Soviets sent in the 70s. Is the MER team planning anything special? Congratulations to you and the team on your amazing mission. Um, I don't know if we're, I don't know if we're gonna plan anything special. We definitely should though. Um, and, and now we will. <laughs> Darn it, now we will. Uh, thank you for, for recognizing that achievement. Let's, uh, let's start here. Oh, how, how did the, what's the geolog, geological history of how that Gale Crater and the mountain formed? What's the geologic history of how the Gale Crater mountain formed? That's an outstanding question. In fact, that's one of the goals of the mission to figure out. Um, so I can't tell you the answer, but I want to tell you the answer. Different hypotheses. Uh, one hypothesis is that the entire region was buried by sediments carried by the wind, carried by water, both, and that those sediments have been eroded over time, exposing this mountain, leaving this mountain exposed. Maybe the mountain was part of the original central peak of the crater, for example. Uh, there's other hypotheses that say that the mountain is just the debris deposited by the wind or water over time, uh, carried by the, over the plains surrounding into uh, the crater, so it was sort of slowly built up over time instead of uh, slowly being eroded over time. Um, we, un we need to understand the details of whether those sediments are, were transported by water, by wind, what is their composition, what minerals are in there, what's the geologic context of those layers, are they tilted in certain directions that could help us decide among these or other new hypotheses that we invent. So I don't know the answer, but we know it's a fascinating place to explore uh, that detailed past history, and, and hopefully we'll find the answer. So ask me again in like two years, <laughs> or five, <laughs> or 10. <laughs> yes. 
Suppose you accidentally encountered a subterranean life form like a uh, virus or a bacteria on Mars. Would you be able to know that you actually had found one and would you be able to tell anything at all about it? If we accidentally discovered a subterranean life form like a virus or a bacterium on Mars, um, it would have to be uh, macroscopic enough for us to see in the, the microscopic images, so it would have to be pretty big if we were to actually see it and conclusively say, oh my gosh, that's a bacterium or a beetle. Um, so you wouldn't know it, you wouldn't be able to analyze DNA, for instance? Well, or, no, there's no, no equipment to analyze DNA. Uh, we'd have to be phenomenally lucky to uh, get, to, to drill into it, turn into a powder and get it into the chemistry set inside and have it be a large enough fraction of the, the drill tailings to detect complex, long chains of carbons and hydrogens, which might be typical of, of DNA, for example. But there's no equipment on board to specifically do that. Um, turns out that you know, most of the, the tools you'd want to do that kind of stuff are still giant laboratory-sized things that have not been miniaturized. Uh, and so the search for life by vehicles like Curiosity and Spirit and Opportunity is either a macroscopic one or an indirect one through chemistry, through certain you know, uh, ratios of elements and inferences that there might have been uh, biotic processes going on there. So very, very unlikely that we'd be able to see some definitive evidence. It'd be cool. Oh, yeah. Um, when I heard, first heard about clays and then sulfates, my first thought was you have incipient plate tectonics, it shuts down, heat builds up, and blam, you get your volcanism. I've talked to a few planetary geologists who weren't too impressed by that, but uh, what is the thinking about the two different epochs and also about early possible plate tectonics on Mars? Yeah, so, I mean, there's lots of ways to form clays and sulfates and, and other alteration minerals. So, uh, so I don't think anyone, any of us are, or at least should be, married to a specific, you know, story. Let's all keep our minds open um, and, uh, and, and see, what, uh, see what we see. Um, but in, in terms of, what was the last part of your question? About uh, whether oh, the think, any new thinking plate, about the plate tectonics. Yeah, so, so there, and there's also no, uh, to the best of my knowledge, no convincing evidence that there ever was plate tectonics on Mars. It seems to be a one-plate planet. It's one reason the volcanoes get so big, uh, because they, they, the magma source sits there in one spot and just spews out. And the magnetic uh, stripes, it doesn't. The, the magnetic stripes are very controversial that they're stripes. There's, there's magnetic... Uh, places that preserve what was probably an ancient magnetic field when the core was partially molten, uh, but there's there's no consensus that there are stripes like sea floor like on the Earth's sea floor or anything like that. So I think the evidence is is is, is equivocal at this point. Yeah. First of all, very nice talk. So congratulations on your work. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I was looking at some of your EDS measurements, and I didn't see any rare earth or transition uh, elements in there. And do you expect that to be in your core, or and, and also, do you see any evidence of calcium carbonates? Yeah, uh, because this is a Caltech audience, I should have put rare earth and transition elements <laughs> plots in my presentation. I'm probably the first person to stand at this podium and not show a rare earth element plot uh, huh. in this auditorium. Um, uh, we, we have a, a lot of data on rare earth elements uh, that come from the Apex-S instruments on spirit, opportunity, and curiosity. Uh, and, and they are, uh, those elements are used as, as uh, tracers of different kinds of geochemical processes. Um, I'm trying to think if any of them have, sh I mean, you know, there are, there are places where you know, we see, well, I don't, I don't want to quote anything because I don't remember it in detail, but I know that there are places where part of the story has been told through uh, some of the rare, rare earth elements and ones that are, you know, less compatible with certain uh, uh, mineralogies and more compatible with others. Um, so there, there is a community among the science team that does look into that, and if you really want, I can direct you to some research papers and you can catch up on all that. That'd be great, but just one last question. So is the, is the going bet that it's calcium carbonate in the core, or is anyone betting on that? In your calcium carbonate in the core? Uh, well, not in the core, as you're drilling down. Oh, in the drill. You're coring samples. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't know if, uh, so we haven't seen uh, much evidence either in orbital data or surface measurements for, for uh, carbonates at this particular location. It's been mostly sulfates. 
Um, so I think there's you know, a number of folks betting that there'll be some calcium sulfate, maybe gypsum, maybe some other uh, calcium su uh, sulfate phase in that as part of that. And we can see inside the drill hole a little bit of a, maybe part of a vein that got drilled into. Uh, I think carbonates would be a surprise. Uh, but Mars has surprised us before, so we shall see soon enough. Yeah. I'm curious whether on future rovers they might use some kind of, a, in essence, a, a um, rain wiper system oh, to excellent. wipe the dust off. I'm so glad you asked that question. I'm glad because every single time I've given this talk, someone has asked that question, and you're the guy. Uh, it's a great question. It's a great question, and I like when people ask it because I think the answer is not at all obvious. Okay? Could we put a wiper blade or some you know, compressed air or something? Sure, absolutely. Our engineering friends will say, of course, I could build a wiper blade. It's not rocket science. It is rocket science, but it, you know, it's not <laughs> rocket science. Uh, absolutely could be done. And then the engineer will say, what do you want to trade for it? I get fixed mass. I've got limited volume and power. OK, I can put your wiper blade system on. You want to get rid of a redundant radio transmitter? Do you want to throw some of these cameras off? What do you want to trade for it? And then you stop and you ask yourself, hmm. And then you go back to the engineer and you say, how long will that rover live without a wiper blade? I guarantee you it will live at least 90 days on Mars. Sold. <laughs> and that's the trade you make. It's not that it can't be done. And we, you consciously choose not to do that and trade that mass, volume, and power and cost for other things. Thank you. Yep. I just wanted to ask about the uh, equipment. You said it could take up to weeks to get it ready to start studying, and I was wondering why that was. What equipment? Uh, you, you said you passed by some rocks yeah. that oh, you want to oh, study, oh, yeah. but you couldn't. Yeah, so, so all, of the, all of the instruments and all the systems and subsystems on these vehicles have to be checked out before they can actually be used. And so uh, you know, before we did that first drive away, for example, the rover drivers w wiggled the wheels and did a little, you know, uh, uh, okay, okay, now we can drive away. Uh, before we, um, you know, use the... Uh, the, uh, the arm, there had to be a bunch of tests of, are the heaters working right? Is the voltages correct being sent to the arm motors? You know? And all of those, that takes a day. Because you tell the rover to do something, you wait, sends the answer back. Tell the rover to do something, you wait, sends the answer back the next day. They're, we're never, almost never in real time communication with the vehicles. And so in, the science instruments as well have to go through a series of checkouts and calibrations. Um, and the laser instrument is one of the more complicated ones, and they had a whole set of internal calibrations they had to do, and checks, and double checks, and you know, apply a voltage, and just make sure the thing doesn't short out, and try another, you know, and that just just takes time, and, and that time and the power to do those checks has to be fit into a schedule where the engineers are also checking things out on the rover, and you've only got a certain amount of power each day or time each day, and so. It's this massive resource problem that has to be optimized to keep the vehicle safe and to get the instruments working properly. And by, that just hadn't been done in time for when we encountered this stuff. We were making good progress on the driving, and uh, so we had to decide, do we want to stop and wait until it's the laser instruments turn? And we, we, the arm hadn't been checked out at all, so we knew we couldn't put the arm instruments down on that. And that was going to be a long time. Uh, and so we decided, because we were seeing this stuff in a lot of places, because we were going the opposite direction and we knew we'd be coming back, let's, let's hit it on the way back. Thank you. Yep. Again, thank you for coming up, Professor. It was an excellent talk. Thank you. Um, in one of your frames, you showed that uh, it was a timeline of future probes that we want to send to Mars. And another one looked very similar to Curiosity. So my question is, what instruments do we have an idea of putting on it? And what experiments do we have an idea of carrying out? That's a, that's a great question. There's probably uh, 10 of my colleagues in the room who are asking themselves the same question, because they want to propose those instruments. Uh, we don't know the answer yet. Uh, what we do know is that in order to keep that mission as cost effective as possible, they're going to use a lot of either spare parts or very similar equipment as Curiosity. 
Similar landing system, sky crane system, there's actually a bunch of spare parts still available for that. That'll help bring the, the price tag down. Uh, the goal, the goal is to get that mission a billion dollars cheaper than Curiosity. Curiosity is a two and a half billion dollar mission. About, that's about an F-22, right? Um, that's what that mission costs, and the goal for NASA is to get the next, the 2020, down to about one and a half, which is a tall order, and it means you know, using efficiency as much as possible. We can't send exactly the same payload, most likely, for that cost, because some of the instruments are just really expensive and difficult and complex. So there's a group now that was commissioned by NASA that's off thinking about that issue that'll produce a report sometime in May or June that makes some recommendations based on the last several years of National Academy of Sciences reports and recommendations. That set of recommendations will then go to NASA, and then sometime this summer, probably, NASA will put out what they call an announcement of opportunity to the world and say, we're gonna send this vehicle to Mars. We want it to have maybe some cameras, maybe some spectrometers, maybe whatever you want. Send us your proposals. And then they'll convene a review panel, try to get everything to fit. The science needs to happen, and the mass that's available, and the volume that's available, and the dollars that are available, pick a set of instruments and, and fly them to Mars in 2020. Thank you. Yep. Oh, thank you for the wonderful talk, Professor. Um, so I have a two-point question. Uh, the question would be, what are the main constrictions uh, we take into consideration when we are making something like a rover? Because doing this on Earth is completely different from like putting this on Mars, right? The atmosphere is different. Like we do not know what we're facing. Yeah. That would be the first point. And the second point is, um, well, I'm a bioengineering major, so I'm always into biology. So why isn't that NASA has tried to like do any any kind of elemental biological analysis so far on Mars mm -hmm. because you can go through the elemental analysis through biological analysis too. Mm -hmm. So yeah, what great, are those? Yeah. Great questions. Um, so your first point, uh, th you're right. These, these um, I often refer to these robots as uh, wild animals that are in their native environment on Mars. They are not built for this Earth. Right. Uh, they are spindly and they groan under the gravity of our planet. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're built for Mars. They're, they're designed for that environment. They love the cold, though not too cold. They love the low gravity. Um, they apparently do okay in, in the dust, uh, especially if you're nuclear powered instead of solar powered, which is what Curiosity is. Um, so the, you know, what, has to, what you have to factor into is what's the environment like? And then you think also about practical things. How much mass can I get into the top of that rocket? Right. How much volume can I fit into there? Mm -hmm. How much mass can I deliver to the surface of Mars? How do I slow down gracefully? Mm -hmm. How much money do I have? You know, sure. So all that stuff <laughs> goes into it. Uh, second part of your question, there are a bunch of people who are thinking about doing biologic measurements on Mars. Mm -hmm. There's a NASA um, research program, several NASA research programs that are designed to fund mostly university researchers, but also JPLers and other government labs to design and build and test prototypes for instruments that would search for DNA or other biosignatures. Mm -hmm. um, there, I think a lot of that work is still relatively immature mm -hmm. because you, know, you have to build these things so that they can survive the shock of a launch, the shock of a landing, uh, 110 degrees below zero Celsius at night, dusty near vacuum environment with hard UV streaming down on you. I mean, it's a violent place. Just, sure. You can't just take your lab instrument, put it sure. on a rocket and send sure. it. So, uh, but there is a community that's moving in that direction partially NASA funded. Um, so, uh, you know, if you, if you look at uh, meeting abstracts for the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference over the last few years, you'll find them. Thank you so much. Sure. Hi, you mentioned, uh, you mentioned opportunity or curiosity is nuclear powered. How does that benefit, obviously, for the longevity? I mean, we got nine years for solar powered and could that literally be a 10 or 15 year mission? And can you talk about future power sources for future missions? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm already planning for my grandchildren to t take over some of my uh, scientific responsibilities. <laughs> um, 
I mean, you know, the Voyager is still going with similar power supplies, right? And, and Vo the Voyagers are predicted to go into the 2020s. Uh, and, you know, Curiosity uses the same kind of power supply that, um, that, uh, that those vehicles use. So the nice thing is it's, it's a steady source of power. Um, the non-intuitive bummer kind of thing is it's not more power than Spirit and Opportunity had. It's a steady supply of about the same. Uh, so we don't depend upon the sun anymore, except for thermal environment, keeping the temperatures reasonable. So we can't... Science all year round. Science all year round. Science at night, if we want. Uh, we don't have headlights, but uh, the microscope has a couple of LEDs we could use. Um, but we still have to budget it very carefully because it's not just like infinite power, okay? It, it, it can get spent very quickly on driving or drilling or heaters. If you want to operate at night, you're spending most of your power heating the equipment above about minus 40 because it's minus 110 outside. Um, so it, it is, not, it is I, I like it compared to solar panels because we're not up to the whims of the season, uh, but I wish that it was you know, really more beefed up than it, than it is. But maybe we'll, maybe we'll get there with the next rover. Okay. I guess we have to cut it short and uh, want to again say thank you to the Planetary Society, right? And thank you to uh, KISS and uh, thank you all for coming and have a great night. Thank you everyone. Once again, let's thank Jim Bell for that spectacular journey through Mars and beyond. Thank you.